This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode, which features James Golden talking about the naturalistic garden he's built around his home in New Jersey. James's garden has been created intuitively over time and sits perfectly within the landscape. In fact, it is a landscape in its own right. Sometimes baffling, sometimes threatening, and without utilitarian purpose, the garden is nonetheless life-affirming, vital, and dramatically beautiful in different ways from one moment to the next. I began by asking James to tell us about the garden. Well, first thing, my house is in my garden, so I live in the garden. Uh, It's an extremely naturalistic garden, though one might uh, be hard put to define what a naturalistic garden is. Uh, It's very much of its place. Uh, We bought a house in the woods. There was no open space. Uh, There were sort of a monoculture of juniper trees behind the house. There was an open field when the house was built in 1965. So our first task was to cut 70 or 80 trees and make open space. Uh, The garden has very difficult soil, heavy, heavy clay, very wet, which limits the range of plants I can use. It also means I have to use what some people might consider to be rather coarse plants. For example, I had dreamed of having a peat out off light garden, uh, but his plants can't survive in my garden. It's simply the, the conditions are too difficult. It's quiet. It's isolated in the woods. Uh, it can be a, a bit frightening at night because it's so dark. Uh, it's full of wildlife. We have lots of uh, eagles, hawks, raptors, hundreds of frogs because of the wetness. And I guess the other, uh, another major characteristic is that it's a very immersive garden. The plants grow tall and large by midsummer. There are many winding paths that intersect. You can't make your way through the garden in one pass. You make have to make choices and go different directions. Some people even get lost in it, though it's relatively small. It's only about one and a half acres, which I think is something less than one hectare. But uh, the impression it gives is of being very large. And I could show you some photographs of I consider it to be a landscape garden because I'm I'm trying to define what I mean by that because it encompasses the sky, the trees surrounding the clearing in the woods, uh, and you can achieve certain effects of uh, that make it appear to be immense at times. I when I was reading the book, one of the things that struck me is that you said about the fact that you can get lost in it, uh, and how you created the paths through the garden. But there isn't sort of a, a defined start and end to it. And it made me think, you know, who did you design the garden for? Was it for yourself to get lost in, or did you always have at the back of the, your mind that you might accept visitors to it? Uh, well. It took me years to come to this conclusion. I think probably I designed it so that I could get lost in it. And then I saw virtue in other people getting lost in it. The other thing that I kind of, that interested me reading the book was the type of gardener that you are. Uh, I'm certainly a minimal interventionist gardener. When I started the garden, uh, you know, conditions were rather rough. We cut trees, we mowed, but I didn't remove any of the weeds or indigenous vegetation. Uh, I had been reading a book by Noel Kingsbury, uh, one of his early books called The New Perennial Garden. 
And in that book, he had a section titled Planting Directly into Rough Grass. I had been struggling with how to, uh, how to uh, approach putting a garden into this wild, rather coarse landscape. And Noel recommended planting very large specimens of highly competitive plants directly into the existing vegetation. Uh, this isn't a new idea. It's, it's something that's repeated, has been repeated many years later by uh, Thomas Rayner and Claudia West in their book, Planting in a Post-Wild World, when they talk about green mulch. But these large plants gradually shaded out much of the indigenous vegetation and took control. So they were, they're a method of controlling the ground and controlling the garden. I also paid a lot of attention to keeping the ground covered at all costs, which is one reason I didn't try to remove existing vegetation, because it gave a certain stability and any any removals, any opening of the ground would introduce instability. It would allow for seeding in of new things. So I just, if I had the ground covered, I kept it covered with whatever was there. Plants, of course, not mulch or artificial things. We had uh, a lot of, I think what is considered in, in Britain to be a pernicious weed, uh, Equisetum, mare's horsetail. Uh, in spring, it comes up and covers large areas of ground. And I think it's an extremely beautiful plant. It, it, it doesn't harm other plants. It doesn't retard their growth. It simply fades into the background. Uh, so I use techniques like that. I kept what I could and added what was necessary to try to control the garden. I think reading the book, it struck me that the garden very much developed naturally, intuitively. And I wondered if you felt that if you'd sat down and plotted the garden on paper, particularly the planting, would it be as successful from a horticultural and an aesthetic standpoint? Uh, I do not think it would have been as successful if I had planned it on paper. I did plan on paper to the extent that I tried to judge distances, because since I was removing trees and pushing back the the woodland edge, I, I, I got the survey of the house and tried to get a feel for how far back the woodland edge need to be, needed to be pushed to allow room for the garden and to give me uh, pleasant and practically workable proportions. But the planting itself, I did not plan on paper at all. It was, I would say, very intuitive. And to some extent, because we do not have fabulous nurseries like you do, uh, I was very limited in my plant selection. I used to, at the time I was working in the in the city and going out on weekends and taking long weekends and I would go out and spend hours driving from nursery to nursery just hoping to discover something that would suit my needs. I needed large plants, you know, two or three or even larger gallons in size. Uh, one of the first plants I found was Rubecchia maxima. After that, I decided to try the uh, some of the prairie plants from the American Midwest. They're various sylphiums with large leaves, and they're very tall. Some grow six to ten feet tall. So that's the direction I took. Yeah, and do you think... Actually, it was a good thing that you were limited in your plant choices because sometimes I know I can be like a child in a sweet shop and I will just pick things. But actually, if you've got a limited palette, maybe you have to work harder to get it to work. Uh, it was very fortunate that I was limited. Uh, 
Uh, Mahdi Don visited my garden a couple of years ago. Uh, and one of the things he remarked, uh, I think in his magazine, I'm not sure, was that he thought the garden was better for having been so constrained in plant selection. And I think that that is the case. So it seems as if you're quite a fearless and, and philosophical gardener and you are ready to try plants, you're ready to let them be and to fail and to remove them if they don't work. Do you do you think that you are like that quite, you know, relatively laid back and hands off and just see what happens? Uh, yes. Uh, I do not care for the act of gardening, for the labor of gardening. Uh, so I'm. it's easy for me to be hands off. That doesn't mean I don't work in the garden. Uh, and I used to work much more, but I've gotten older now. Uh, I'm quite philosophical about gardens, and I have always been since I developed an interest in gardens. Uh, like many people, my favorite garden in the world is Rauschen. Uh which I consider to be quite a philosophical place. Yeah, garden is bound up with my life and uh, my beliefs and my thinking patterns and the way I live in the world and how I think about the world uh, with my emotions. I think gar gardens are very emotional places. They're places where you play out. It's a, the place where I play out my life. I don't mean that I don't leave my garden and have other aspects to my life, but it's very much the center of my life and my thinking and now my writing. Mm. It's your artistic expression. I should say that uh, when I graduated from college, I planned to New York, to, go, to move to New York. Uh, get in an MFA program, get a degree in poetry, and become a poet. Uh, that didn't work out. I discovered I had to get a job in order to live. And, uh, yeah, this is uh, a late-blooming uh, rebirth of that, that earlier interest. It also goes way back. I... Uh, after my first year in college, I was very fortunate in being able to, I grew up in Mississippi, which is not not a place of great culture. Uh, after my first year of college, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Europe, work for six weeks in Germany with a friend. Uh, then we got a URL pass and tra traveled to Vienna and Salzburg and Venice and Florence and Rome and France and Paris and London. And uh, I was introduced to a, a different culture, uh, subculture centuries old, uh, with, with many touchstones, you know, like St. Peter's in Rome. Uh, uh, I was just introduced to a whole new world. And that has really influenced my thinking about gardens, uh, just the vast range of Western culture that hadn't been available to me as a boy in Mississippi in the Deep South. Given that gardening is this process of observation and there's an element of waiting, how long is long enough to make a garden? Well, I, th I, th I think there's never enough time to make a garden because the garden making never ends. But very practically speaking, I would say it, it took me six or eight, seven years to have a garden that I felt I would be happy to show to someone because I didn't have, I couldn't depend on hard structure for interest at the time. Though gr gradually we built several hundred feet of stone walls and I added pools and 
uh, a big storm circle. Uh, initially, I just had to grow a lot of plants over a what was for me a substantially large area, and it took several years to do that. And I had to have time to experiment. I once I had begun planting large physical plants, I tried experimenting with broadcast seeding. I added many of my large prairie plants by simply throwing the seed out and letting it come up. Uh, so it, it took six or seven years to get to that point. So speaking about your stone circle, I was just enthralled by the idea of it because it serves no other purpose than an aesthetic one. And I wondered if that is something that came about because you've got, I know you you say your garden is relatively small, but I suppose to us here in the UK, that's a, a relatively big garden. So I wondered if your stone circle came about because you have the luxury of space to play with. I mean, it just seems quite extravagant to me as a gardener from a small island where garden features quite often have to be multifaceted you know i'm intrigued by this idea of this stone circle that just sits in its space as a a work of art really well uh we're, I, I was very fortunate in that there's a lot of native stone uh the land we're on though it is forest now has been farmed at least once in the past perhaps several times i don't know there are very few signs of it except that if you walk through our woods you will come to rows of stone uh and intersecting rows of stone so obviously someone put in tremendous amounts of labor collecting the stone and and putting it at the edge of fields creating these large rectangles and both of our the sides of our property had you know, many, many tons of rock available. Uh, and of course, from the beginning, I wanted to use that rock in the garden. Uh, the circle itself, initially, I planted three Japanese willows, uh, the Japanese fantail willows. The name fantail because the limbs fasciate, they flatten and form beautiful patterns. The botanical name is uh, Salix saccolinensis seca, or Salix saccolinensis udensis. Uh, and the three, they were small when I planted them, and they grew to be large. And I had wanted to use the stone, and it occurred to me the circle would be an ideal visual complement for those trees. So I really did the opposite of what one might expect, was, which would have been to design the feature, design the circle, build it, plant the trees, and let them grow. I did the opposite. Uh, I did not. I don't want my garden to have any sort of utilitarian purpose in the sense that American gardens are rife with outdoor kitchens and barbecues and ball fields and play equipment and uh, swimming pools. I wanted the garden just to be garden. Uh, so the circle was a symbol. And I mean that I use the word very vaguely because I think people can interpret it in many different ways. And I wanted it to evoke a sense of mystery, perhaps a gathering place for people. And you might imagine many different uh, stories. Uh, I think back to uh, Hawthorne and, uh, well, even before Hawthorne, but the, the early American religious settlements that punished I guess you would have to call them sinners, adulterers, uh, the Salem witch trials, where people were actually tried and uh, convicted, and some were even hanged. Uh, there, there could be very dark stories associated with the circle, or much more, much happier stories, like a, uh, 
Sunday worship service in the woods. I wanted it to be a a, a prod to thought and emotion and memory, but I wanted it to be open to interpretation. So it it is a totally purposeless circle, but it has probably some extremely valuable purposes. They're just not material or practical. Thinking about the garden, although it it doesn't have kind of material uses, as you say, it, as such, or or maybe not traditional ones, it is the ultimate use of space because it's very much, uh, you know, distinct seasons in the garden and you seem to have four gardens in one. But then as I was reading, I thought, actually, no, you don't. You have 365 gardens in one year, maybe many, many more than that, depending on the quality of the light and the weather that you have. So did you set out to make a garden that varies so dramatically from one moment in time to another? You're reminding me of uh, the book by Dan Pearson and uh, Midori to the, about the millennium forest. I think in Japan they have 72 or 76 seasons. Uh, I, it, it just came to mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I think I did. I think I learned in the initial years that being uh, located in a located in a clearing in the woods, that there were changes every day. The weather changes how the garden looks. Fog changes how the garden looks. Rain, sunlight, shadow. And, and there's also a vast seasonal change. And because I cut the garden to the ground once a year, there's that major change so that much of the garden grows out of the flat earth anew each year. So, you know, by by May, uh, the growth may be one to one and a half feet tall. By July, it may be, you know, some plants may be 10 or 11 feet tall. Uh, and then there are the seasonal changes with color, with, you know, autumn being one of my favorites. Uh, so I actually hadn't... hadn't uh, put it to myself the way you spoke of it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for giving me that. You're welcome. So thinking about the Millennium Forest, um, obviously that is built with a thousand year time scale in mind. So what is the future for Federal Twist? I think my garden will end when I do. I can't imagine that anyone on earth would want to by our house in my garden. Uh, it's so personal. It requires uh, knowledge that I have learned living in it. I'm sure someone else could do that, but the the, the likelihood I'll, I could find someone who can afford the house and buy the land and would even want to do it is very, very small. I, I really, really think of my garden as a garden that will exist until I die, and then it will fade back into the woods. I actually have given some thought to it, and you know, maybe at some point I want to just cut it down and and plant trees and start a reversion to some kind of woodland garden, more akin to what was might have been there under ideal conditions in the past. I really don't know. That would be a hard decision to make. But definitely, right, as I see it now, it ends when I, when I end. Should all gardens have the ability to be absorbed back into the landscape when their time has come? I don't know the right answer, but it makes you confront your own and the mortality of others when you contemplate a question like that. And it makes you realise how much meaning is wrapped up in the seemingly simple act of gardening. Thank you very much to James for talking to me about his beautiful book and his legendary garden. Thanks to you for listening, and to those of you who've rated and reviewed the podcast recently. I do read them, and you're all very kind. Here's Dr Ian Bedford now, talking about bugs in your window frames 
and why you should tread carefully if you're thinking of relocating them. Throughout winter, many of our homes will have provided a safe haven for some vicious killers from the bug world, keeping them safe from freezing temperatures until spring, when they'll return to the garden to continue their quest to capture and eat other bugs. And one group of these killers will likely be adult ladybirds, in particular an invasive species from Asia called Harmonia axioridis, more commonly known to us as the harlequin ladybird due to its array of different colour forms. Many people would have heard about the harlequins when they first appeared in Britain during 2004, since they attracted a lot of attention from the media, who regularly reminded us that this voracious foreign predator threatened our native insects, in particular the resident species of ladybird. However, as time passed by and the harlequin continued to spread through the country, the fear of an ecological disaster began to fade. In fact, it soon became apparent that it had become Britain's most common ladybird species and a great food source for other insectivorous wildlife. Primarily though, harlequins are a predator of aphids, with both adults and their larvae, which look like little six-legged crocodiles, capturing and eating around 50 each day. But it's also true that when aphids are scarce, the harlequins will search for other small insects to eat too, and even resort to cannibalism. However, within a healthy habitat, aphids should always be plentiful, and then the harlequins will play their part in reducing the infestations to plant safe levels. In fact, their insatiable appetite has meant they're often more effective than other ladybird species for controlling aphids on trees, such as sycamore and beech, and also the aphids that cause leaf curling on fruit trees. So all in all, the invading harlequins, rather than becoming a problem to Britain's ecology, have actually become an asset, helping to safely control aphids biologically for gardeners and growers. But a word of caution, harlequin ladybirds overwinter in groups, sometimes very large groups, often around window frames and in the loft, where they'll cause no harm whilst they remain dormant. However, if disturbed, their defence is to do something we call reflex bleeding, oozing a yellow liquid <laughs> from their leg joints, which besides its acrid smell, will stain absorbent furnishings. So if you ever need to relocate a group of overwintering harlequins to somewhere more suitable, then make sure you do it very gently. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. <laughs>